Hello everybody, I'm Abby with This Week Community News and we are here for our uh, latest Hidden Gems video and we are at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Museum and Cartoon Library and I'm here with Caitlin McGurk, the Associate Curator for Outreach and Assistant Professor. Perfect. And uh, so tell us a little bit about the museum which we're inside right now. Sure. So um, the museum is attached to our library. Uh, the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library Museum is the largest collection of comics and cartoon art in the entire world. Um, that means about 3 million pieces are held wow. here. Uh, that breaks down to about 350,000 pieces of original art, whether it's original art from political cartoons dating back to the 1600s, or original Disney art, or wow. original comic strips, pages from graphic novels, um, comic books, things like that. We also have about 30,000 comic books, um, over 6,000 boxes of what we call manuscript material, which okay. is all of the paperwork related to an artist's life and career. Wow. So we do save and display things like cartoonists' fan mail and hate mail <laughs> and <laughs> contracts and receipts and the kind of work that's going to give our researchers a sense of what that artist's life was like. Um, we also have a very large collection of what we call ephemera, which is an archives term for miscellaneous objects. Okay. For us, that tends to be merchandise, so you'll always see merchandise displayed in the museum from our collection. Okay. But we also have some unique items in that collection, like some of the first handmade cosplay costumes dating wow. back to the 1940s. Oh my gosh. And in addition to all of that, we have a collection of 2.5 million comic strip clippings clipped <laughs> out of the newspaper and amassed by one person in their home. Wow. So this place is, is a gigantic archive. And the museum that we're standing in right now is well, the facility that we use to share all of the work with the public. Okay, and the best part about this is that it's all free to anybody who wants to come here. And you are on the Ohio State University campus, we didn't mention that part, but we are on the OSU campus, but it's free and open to the public. Uh, and you can see the museum and the library anytime you want. Yeah, the museum is open from 1 to 5 p.m. Tuesday through Sunday, only closed on Mondays. And the library downstairs is open from 9 to 5 p.m. Uh, Monday through Friday. Okay, perfect. So when you walk into the museum, you see this right behind us. So tell us a little bit about this, Caitlin. Yeah, so this is really exciting. This is the um, drawing table uh, owned by Chester Gould. Chester Gould was the creator of Dick Tracy. So this is the drawing table where every single Dick Tracy comic strip was ever drawn. Wow. As well as his cabaret, we have his drawing utensils, and we have hundreds upon hundreds of the original um, art pieces from Dick Tracy. Uh, a really neat little um, short story about this is that when we first got this and had it set up for the grand opening of this new facility, we had the drawing table facing the normal way, you know, horizontally. Yeah. Well, Dick, um, Chester Gould's daughter, who's in her 90s, came to our grand opening and she said, oh no, my dad used to <laughs> draw on it this way. And so we restructured it and we asked her while she was here, what this is. Yeah. We weren't sure if this was ink buildup or what it might be. And she told us this fantastic story, which was that as Chester Gould was working on daily comics of, of Dick Tracy, you know, seven days a week for decades upon decades, mm -hmm. every time he'd finish inking a comic strip, he would take a kitchen match, strike the match on the side of the drawing table, and then hold the open flame underneath the original art in order to dry the ink fast. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Which just seems totally outrageous. Yeah. But we went and we looked at the original art in the collection after she told us this, and it has little like soot marks <laughs> underneath it from him doing this. Oh my gosh. So just That's a amazing. fantastic, really wonderful thing to be able to uh, know about an artist and the kind of thing that makes being able to study original art in person even more rich. Mm hmm. Oh wow, and then on this opposite wall we have Calvin and Hobbes, which most people recognize obviously the Calvin and Hobbes collection and the cartoons. Yeah, so Calvin and Hobbes was created by the wonderful Bill Watterson, who is an Ohio native and current resident. Um, fun fact is that we believe there are more cartoonists from Ohio than any state in the country. Really? Including probably some of the most influential cartoonists in comics history. Um, the Bill Watterson collection, I would say, is likely our, our most popular collection. We have all of the original art from Calvin and Hobbes, other than a very um, select few pieces that have sold at auction for fundraisers. <laughs> yeah. um, we also have work that Bill Watterson did outside of Calvin and Hobbes, including work that he did uh, when he was at Kenyon College for their um, student newspaper. Oh, wow. So it is a wonderful collection, and visitors to the Cartoon Library um, should know that they can always see a selection of Calvin and Hobbes work on display. We probably change this over every three months or so. Okay, well then let's go on a little tour of the museum. So we've already mentioned the name Billy Ireland, but, but who is he for people who don't know? Yeah, so over here we have a piece 
from Billy Ireland's uh, wonderful feature, which was called The Passing Show. Billy Ireland was the lead cartoonist for the Columbus Dispatch from the late 1800s until he passed away in 1935. And he was kind of a, a local celebrity in Columbus back then. He had this beautiful full page feature that ran every single Sunday in the Dispatch. And his term, The Passing Show, was his title for like, you know, everyday life passing us by, things going on around us. It's what we would consider an editorial cartoon or a um, commentary piece about everyday life in central Ohio. He talked about everything from things going on in you know, sports on campus to theater downtown to um, you know, serious issues in government. Uh, he was a, a really amazing creator. And one of the most significant things about him for us is that he was Milton Kniff's mentor. And Milton Kniff was our founder. If we walk over here, we can see this wonderful display case that we have uh, dedicated to Milton Kniff. So the story of, of how he came to be was through a very generous donation from this artist over 40 years ago. So Milton Kniff was at one point one of the most successful American cartoonists in history, best known for his comic strips uh, Terry and the Pirates and Steve Canyon. These comics ran every single day in the newspaper um, all across the United States. He had millions of readers. It was kind of a household name back mm -hmm. in, his, in, in his time. But before becoming this very famous cartoonist, he was a student at Ohio State. Wow. So Kniff was from the Dayton area, went to school here at OSU in the 1920s, graduated in 1930, and then went on to become this superstar artist. But when he was in school as a student here in the 20s, he got his start in the comics world by being hired from by Mil uh, Billy Ireland at wow. the Columbus Dispatch. Okay. So a really special piece is right here in the center of this case. This is the piece that Milton Kniff, as a very young man, did in 1925 to convince Billy Ireland to hire him for his very <laughs> first art job, wow. which was at, as you can see, the Columbus Dispatch. Oh my gosh. And this is so unique because we have the um, Ohio State Stadium in the first panel, um, the observatory in the second panel, the dispatch offices. And the story behind this is that apparently when Kniff first approached Billy Ireland about working for him uh, under his wing at the dispatch, Billy said to him, well, you know, maybe uh, draw me something that'll make me jump out of my seat. And Kniff, of course, came back with this piece, which ends with Billy Ireland jumping out of his chair. <laughs> and that uh, started Kniff's career. And again, he went on to become one of the most uh, influential and important cartoonists in history. Wow, that, that is amazing. And you, you already touched on a couple of things that have been donated to the library, but how do you get new pieces? So our collection is almost entirely donation-based. Uh, we rely on the generosity of um, collectors, of artists themselves, and we're getting new things in all the time, literally every day, whether it's an envelope of stuff or a semi-truck of <laughs> collections, um, maybe wow. when someone has passed away and who bequeathed mm -hmm. us their work. Okay. So um, when we first started over 40 years ago through Milton Kniff's initial donation, um, no other libraries in the United States were really collecting this kind of material. Mm. Unfortunately, comics has been historically stigmatized as a lower art form, mm. something that people think is just for kids or just for entertainment purposes, and for that reason, was not considered academically acceptable. Oh, so wow. when we actually started actively collecting this work back in the 70s, um, we were one of the only, you know, places in, in the world <laughs> that would, were, was accepting this, this kind of work and mm -hmm. treating it with the respect that it deserved. So donations came flooding in. Okay. So the first one we received was the Milton Kniff Collection, mm -hmm. and originally our name was the Milton Kniff Reading Room. But over the next 10 years that Kniff lived, he was able to convince his contemporaries, other famous cartoonists who had no connection to Ohio State the way he did, mm -hmm. to start donating to us. Wow. And the collection just grew exponentially since Oh my then. gosh. <laughs> That's incredible. And there are two rotating galleries, mm -hmm. and they're, uh, the two that we have now just came in, I think you said last week they just opened. Yeah, yeah. So the room we're in now is the Treasures Gallery. This is a room where visitors can get a sense of the scope of what we collect and the best of what we have. So it's kind of a, a highlights gallery. Items in here tend to stay the same throughout the year. They maybe change uh, every other year or so. Okay. But if you want to take a look down here at these cases, you'll see that this uh, room is lined with these wonderful cases that go through the chronology of comics and also show some different aspects of it. Oh, wow. So we have some beautiful Disney original art here mm -hmm. from Snow White. Um, <clears throat> we also 
have the largest collection of manga outside of Japan. Wow. Oh so my gosh. <laughs> manga is the term for Japanese comics. Mm -hmm. Anime is Japanese animation. We have over 20,000 pieces of manga just wow. in our collection. Um, and most of it is Japanese language manga, but we do have some translations as well. Wow. And we always try to highlight a bit of both the animation and manga collections in our uh, museum. Wow. Visitors can get a sense of the history of comic books down here, the progression from um, <coughs> newspaper comic reprints into superhero comics. We have Captain America kicking <laughs> Hitler in the face right there. Um, early horror comics and romance comics. And then the world of counterculture comics, what we call underground comics. Oh. This is kind of the era in the 60s and 70s where comics started to tackle more serious issues or more personal issues. This sort of led into the world of graphic novels that we know today, wow. where graphic novels can tackle um, any kind of topic, as opposed to the early days where it was mostly kind of sci-fi and adventure and things like that. Mm -hmm. Some recognizable titles in here. Um, <laughs> Bone by Jeff Smith. Jeff Smith is one of our, you know, uh, local celebrities here in Columbus. Uh, Jeff went to Ohio State and at Ohio State created uh, um, the Bone comic strip originally titled Thorn for the Ohio State Lantern. Went on to, to create the Bone comic book, which was then collected into a major graphic novel and is an international bestseller. Hmm. And of course, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which started right there in that comic book yeah. uh, made by, by two young men. Oh my gosh. So then let's go into our uh, first gallery here, and what is the theme of this current gallery? So this exhibit is called Frontline, Editorial Cartoonists and the First Amendment. This exhibit was curated for us by Lucy Shelton Caswell, who is the founding curator of the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library Museum, in partnership with Ann Telnes, who oh. is a Pulitzer Prize winning political cartoonist. Wow. So it means a lot to us that she uh, got involved with this show. Um, this show is really just about how um, political cartoonists interact with freedom of, freedom of speech, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a really a hot <laughs> topic for right. sure right now. <laughs> Important for us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, what you'll see on the walls throughout this exhibit are um, very, very contemporary editorial cartoons. These were actually submitted to us from members of the American Association for Editorial Cartoonists. Oh, wow. Um, and it's work that they uh, have done in the past that speaks to the issue of the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. The cases throughout the exhibit highlight more historic works dating back into the, in the, into the 1800s um, related to uh, free speech. Wow. Yeah, you can see a lot of, you know, current and former presidents uh, oh, yeah. in our, our recent years. Yeah, one of the interesting things for sure about this show is seeing what hasn't changed right. over the years, especially when you look at some of the more historic Right, oh my gosh. Can you even see Bart Simpson up in there? Yep. <laughs> so these two galleries change over two to three times a year. These mm -hmm. are kind of our rotating exhibit galleries. As I mentioned, these shows just opened on, uh, on April 20th, and both of these exhibits will be up until October 20th. Oh, so good. plenty of time for people to come see them. Yes. This exhibit is Drawing Blood, Comics and Medicine, and this was curated for us by Professor Jared Gardner, who's here at Ohio State, a wonderful, wonderful uh, professor, who is also a comic scholar and works a lot in the field of graphic medicine, which is a, a huge movement right now of folks who are creating comics narratives in order to talk about issues of health and, and illness. Mm. But this exhibit also looks at the way that um, medicine and the medical field has been perceived throughout history. In fact, some of the earliest pieces we have in here date back to the 1700s. Wow. And I think what's fascinating about it is it really shows how the perception of doctors in particular have changed over the years. Mm -hmm. So in this early section, we really see a lot of stuff about quack medicine <laughs> and about how much people didn't trust doctors mm -hmm. and how you know the quickest way to, to, uh, to die was typically to go into a hospital <laughs> because you'd you know, catch something, they were um, not, as efficient then as they are sure. now. <laughs> and the way that that um, progressed into the sort of um, doctor as hero narrative. Mm -hmm. So that um, is displayed throughout this show. And uh, the way that comics were helping to uh, kind of promote those narratives about, about medicine, about doctors, um, about quack medicine, about <laughs> patents. Um, we have lots of great comic books on display in here too, showing um, different 
uh, medical narratives. Uh, there were lots of comic books done about the AIDS crisis. Mm. Uh, many, com many political cartoons about um, vaccines and, and the nursing shortages in the, in the 1930s and 40s. This is a really special case because we were able to partner with the Medical Heritage Library, um, the Medical Heritage Center here at Ohio State, who have a massive collection of historic medical instruments, <laughs> some which are pretty frightening, like the um, clyster right there that is used to uh, give enemas, and, um, and all kinds of just kind of fun, wacky stuff, a bleeding bowl. Uh, one of my personal favorites um, is this over here. That's a pair of Milton Kniff's glasses. So um, there was a, uh, at the OSU College of Optometry, um, one of the doctors there was actually writing to celebrities asking them to submit the pairs of glasses they wore to the library in an effort to kind of show off that wearing glasses, you know, wasn't so bad. Wow. You could be cool and wear glasses. <laughs> and uh, Milton yeah. Kniff uh, was one of the people who submitted his, so wow. we had to include them. <laughs> oh my goodness. There's also lots of fun cartoons in here just about, um, you know, kind of gag cartoons about medical practice, about going to doctors, things like that. Um, I think this is, a, this is a fun one right here. The caption for this says, has anyone ever told you you have lovely eyes, ears, nose, and throat, Miss Madwick? <laughs> And then this exhibit kind of um, evolves into talking about that field of graphic medicine that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So these are some pages, both on the wall and in these cases, from some uh, recent graphic novels that are, again, kind of personal medical narratives. Um, these are often made about maybe mental health struggles, uh, medical struggles at large. Mm -hmm. uh, survivor stories um, are often turned into uh, graphic novels as well. Wow. And uh, so we are at the end of the museum, at least of this uh, part of the gallery, but we are going to do a bonus video of the archive library. Could you tell us a little bit about the reading room and then the library downstairs? Sure. So we're on the second floor right now of Sullivan Hall, which is you know where the Billy Ireland is. But the first floor is where our reading room is located, and the reading room is attached to the massive archive. So OSU is a land-grant institution, and our, that means that we're a public institution, and all of our libraries are public, including archives and special collections like us. So anyone who wants to come check out our collection can both see what's up in the galleries or go into the reading room and request anything they want from our, you know, over three million pieces. <laughs> so quite a long library to even look through. Yes. <laughs> All right, well, perfect. So we are going to do a bonus video for that, for, so look for that on our YouTube channel. Uh, but Caitlin, is there any other details? Uh, where can they find out more about the museum before they come? Yeah, so our URL is um, cartoons.osu.edu. We also have a very uh, active Twitter and Instagram account, which is at Cartoon Library. And we're on Facebook as the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library Museum. So please come check it out. It's a great place to visit over the summer with your family. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Caitlin. And we will see you guys next time. And if you have any other suggestions for hidden gems, leave them in the comments. Thank you. Thank you.